Okay, so what we're going to be discussing tonight is the, known as the anti-mind management controversy, a very fancy name for a debate that took place and continues to take place, as we will see. So I'm not, I'm not going to go through a biography of the Rambam. The pertinent information will come out as we discuss the issues. Just to mention that the, this controversy, this attack against the Rambam and his works, takes place over a period of a number of hundreds of years, and it has different recensions in the different parts of this controversy. And basically, they brought broken them into four eras where there were four different prongs of attack. Now, in the last years of the Rambam's life, he dies in 1204, he's 70 years old when he dies. In the last years of the Rambam's life, he published two works, two major works, the Mishnah Torah, as well as the Mona Ruchim, the guide for, for the perplexed. And they were revolutionary texts. Let's talk about the Mishnah Torah, which was printed first. But the Mishnah Torah, for us, we're so used to it, and we're used to systematized, categorized texts, that it's not something unique. But in, in the time that it was written, in 1180, it was something that was so unique, it was something that was so different. And usually when somebody does something new, when you do something that's brand new, you have to expect some kind of pushback, because nobody ever did it before. And what was unique about the Rambam was that he wrote in his preface to the Mishnah Torah, he said, many people have studied the Talmud. They don't really know it well. And they have difficulty with the Talmud, and they have difficulty with the law to be extracted from the Talmud. So what I did was, I spent much of my life studying properly with proper teachers and masters, and I have done all of the legwork for you, and therefore I've written this book, and all you need to do in your library is to have this book, this work, the Mishnah Torah, and a Tanakh, and that's all you need. Because everything is contained in my book, and everything is correct in my book. And that, of course, is a, those are fighting words. Because there are many scholars who are great scholars, and they did know how to extract the laws. But this was the very first time that anybody broke down all of Jewish law into a kind of systematized categories so that it would be very easy to find the law. And you wouldn't have to scour different tractates and different parts to be able to put together a kind of, of a legal brief on any particular topic. And the Rambam, he did the legwork. He did all of that work for us, but people were not happy. They were not happy because they said that what he's telling us is that that's the, that's the, that's the end of all Talmudic scholarship. Nobody needs to be involved in the Talmud anymore. I did it all. You can't do anything better than what I did. And that, that perhaps was a bit boastful on his part, and he was, he was challenged on that. The Moran of Uchim, which was a book also revolutionary, because it was a book of philosophy that addressed, it, it said it in its title, and it was written in Arabic, and its title was The People Who Are Confused, it doesn't mean perplexed, people who are confused about Jewish tradition. And he tells us in the very beginning that the beginning of all knowledge is to know the limitation of your knowledge. But in this book, there are very few limitations. And he even tells you in the preface, this is re really written for people who are adept, the cognoscentic, people adept in logic, reason, and whose cognitive abilities have been developed and have evolved and progressed. And that's what the book was for. And there were many parts of the book, we'll get to that, that were rather questionable for traditionalists when you would compare it to rabbinic literature and rabbinic philosophy. So that was the, the first era, the first attack within the Rambam's own lifetime. And, and we know how he reacted to the attack. One of the comments that he made to, to Ibn Akhman to one of his students was, look, I knew when I wrote the Moan of Ruchim, there would be people who had no clue as to what it meant. 
and these very foolish people read the book, and now they attack me. I would rather write one truth to enlighten one intellectually adept individual than to say something that wasn't true and please a thousand fools. So that was, the, that was his reaction, at least one of the reactions that he had, which wasn't even taken very seriously, because that you, that you say it's heretical is not a comment that con contradict, contradicts what I've said. You just called me a name. It's an ad hominem attack. And he, he, didn't, he didn't respond, as most people don't. He didn't, he didn't respond to ad hominem attacks. He, he responded to intellectual probity. He, he responded to a challenge that was based upon logic and reason and philosophy. And there were many challenges. His students also challenged him. His son challenged him. And he was able to respond in a proper way, and, and sometimes people just disagree with him. And he said, that's OK. People of lesser intellect will disagree with me. But he believed that. I don't believe he was conceited. I believe he just believed that. You're wrong. And, and I am correct. But what happens that is very vexing for us is the, uh, the second round of the anti-Maimonidean controversy, where really it's just not attacking concepts, the, the work that he has. But what they actually did was, there was a, an assault against the Rambam and all philosophic texts. Not only the Rambam, but all philosophic texts. And it was punctuated by the French rabbis with a cherem, with a ban. They banned the books. They banned the first section of Mishnah Torah, Seif Amada, which is a book of philosophy, and they banned the entire book of Moer Nuvuchim. Now, before we move on into this attack, I think there is some background information that would be important to know in understanding that there were certain political implications here as well. Now, when the Rambam wrote the Mishnah Torah, we have to understand how Jewish law, halacha, was dispensed. So if you, you, you remember that there was a Goonate that lived in Iraq for a thousand years, and these academies were the resources of Jewish knowledge, people living in communities outside of Baghdad, which were many, many Jewish communities, North Africa, France, Spain, and Germany, they would send queries to these to the Goonin. And they would respond. That's the what we will call responsive literature. That's the beginning of responsive literature, which began in the 700s, the 8th century, by Rav Achaigom, Sheiltos of Achaigom. We actually have his work right over there. Nobody reads it, but it's good. It's good to have that work. And that is what took place in the 11th century, the beginning of the 11th century, when all of that broke down, and the Muslims removed all of the Jews from that area. There was a Goonate in exile. So <coughs> without getting too much involved, those of you who study Talmud will know this immediately, but it's not, we don't have the time to get involved in these top two or four topics. There was something which is known as the Reish Geluta, the Exilarch. Now the Exilarch was the intermediary between the Jewish community, which is an invisible community, and the political <coughs> authorities, the host government. The host government only needed one thing from the Jews, and that was a head tax, which was, which was rather large. And they said, pay the head tax and we don't see you. You're invisible, we won't bother you. You know, a, a tax from time to time, just to let you know that we're, we're Muslims and you're not Muslims. But basically, they were benign. So that when everybody had to leave Iran, Iran and Iraq, they went to North Africa, basically, and they had this exilarch in, in exile. From one exile to the other exile, but he was the authority, and his name was Shmuel ben Ali. That was his name. And he basically was the authority. He was a great scholar. He was a student of the Gaonim, of, of Shmuel Hanagid, and he was a very, very great scholar, and he would dispense this knowledge. The Rambam, however, gained tremendous popularity almost immediately after he wrote the Mishnah Torah in North Africa, where we there was a very large Jewish community. And rather than going to Shmuel ben Ali for answers to questions, they opened up the Mishnah Torah, and they looked for what the Rambam had to say, and that was the end. So when he realized that nobody was, his cell phone had no messages, 
for a period of time, he realized something was happening, and he ascertained that it was the Rambam. And interestingly enough, it's at that point that we find Shmuel ben Ali attacking certain halachic opinions of the Rambam. Uh, I'm going to mention just, just some of them. I was going to do a different order, but I think this is a better order. So excuse me for this one, one second. So one of the things that the Rambam had written Shows, shows you how religious the people were, that they were agitated by this. One of the things that he wrote was that if you are a shliach tzibur, you don't have to go to the mikvah before you go to the omer. You don't have to. And Shmuel ben Ali said, this, this goes against, this flies against Jewish tradition. And he attacks the Rambam for that. Another tradition that the Rambam says, okay, it's, it's, uh, you have to put it in context. We're dealing now with the 1100s. The Rambam wrote that a woman who is a nida, menstruating, is allowed to leave the house. And Shmuel ben Ali says, he goes against Jewish tradition. You're not allowed, a woman who's a nida is not allowed to leave the house. And he had these kinds of, you know, another one was a little bit more substantive. The Rambam writes, and he does, that if you are taking a boat trip on a large river, as long as you leave on Tuesday, you are allowed to travel in the boat on Shabbos. Shmuel ben Ali says, excuse me. It says in the Gemara, only if you're Yorodei Hayam, only if you're going into uh, the sea, to the ocean. But if it's only a lake or a river, you can't do that. Here's what the Rambam says. These kinds of, these kinds of issues. Now the Rambam responded to these. And the Rambam wrote, this tradition that you write of, that a woman who is a nida cannot leave the house, in fact, it's not Jewish. In fact, it's, it's Muslim. And you've been living with the Muslims for so long that you adopted some of their practices. It's certainly not true. Because when it comes to the chazan going to the, going to the mikvah, he says, I wrote clearly in my, in my response to you that if you look at the Talmud, in, the Talmud Bavli in Brachos, the, the takana of, this is the technicality, of Tfilas Ezra is Botel. So nobody has to go to the mikvah at all, ever. Males, before they die. So he said that your arguments are not substantive. In terms of what you argue about the riverboat, I say to you, when they say Yorodei Hayam, they mean any large waterway where we're not concerned that you're going to get shipwrecked and be close to shore. And the very, very large rivers that I'm speaking about, like the Black Sea, other kinds of rivers, are really the same as the ocean. There's not only, as he writes, the Ukiainis, it's not only the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean that is meant. But those were the kinds of attacks, not, not major attacks, where the Rambam said something, you know, that you're allowed to cook on Shabbos or something like that. But those are the kinds of attacks. And so many believe, many, many believe that there was a lot of, there were, there were political considerations in the, some of the attacks on the Mishnah Torah, which was, you have become a popular authority, and we no longer, we're being replaced by you. Now you can understand where somebody would be miffed, and then they go through the book looking, find me through the book, let me see if I can find a mistake. It's, it seems even great people will, will do that when they, feel, when they feel that their authority is being usurped. But, but one, of the, one of the major issues that the French rabbis had with the Rambam was the Moran of Ruchim. Now, the Moran of Ruchim is a very difficult book. Everybody's aware of the Moran of Ruchim. I'm venturing a guess, and if I'm wrong, I'm apologizing, that not more than five people in this room have read that book from cover to cover. And I think that's very generous on my part. <laughs> and the, the truth is, if you're not very well versed, A, in all of the Greek philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, Plotinus, Heraclitus, all of them, which the Rambam quotes extensively, it will be very difficult to know what the Rambam means. Certainly not if you read it in Hebrew. Even if you read, you know, Penis, Shlomo Penis's English translation, which is quite excellent, it will be very difficult to know exactly what the Rambam means without that background information. So that it really was a book of philosophy. And it was something that, in terms of what he did, was not revolutionary. Perhaps what he said was revolution, but not what he did. Because what he was trying to do is, 
it was trying to reconcile rationalism with traditionalism. In other words, Judaism is based a tremendous amount on revelation. Now, revelation is not philosophy. So a philosopher would never come to this idea, never come to this idea that you would have to ritually slaughter a chicken before you could eat it. There's no philosophic underpinnings to that. Maybe you'd have to anesthetize the chicken, whatever you would come to, but you wouldn't come to the five laws, halacha moshe misina afshita. You never would arrive at that. That's revelation. Now, revelation is not cognitive. Revelation is because God said so. So how do you square that with the fact that we are, we are thinking beings and we come to conclusions based upon epistemology, based upon logic and reason? And what the Rambam was trying to do was trying to show that there is not an issue with that. It can be done. Sometimes it might be difficult, but it can be done. And he's not the first to do that. The very first people to do that were, were much earlier. So that you have Sadi Gaon and Emunot Vadeot who used Islamic philosophy, and just, just be, be so grand, just in parentheses, the Muslims had a renaissance much earlier than the European Renaissance. And part of the Islamic Renaissance was, was very similar to the European in terms that it was art, culture, medicine, science, and philosophy. In the medieval period, philosophy was considered to be a science equal to mathematics and physics. And it was right next to the metaphysics department. Metaphysics was also considered to be a science. That was what, that was the rigour up until the end of the 18th century. Every university until Kant had a metaphysics department, had an astrology department, because that's what they believed at that particular time. And when you get to one of the things that they believed later on. So in the East, they were already acquainted with Aristotle and Plato. They had a great philosopher, Avicenna, and he translated the original, the, the, of the works of Aristotle into, into Arabic. And you had Al-Farabi, also a great Muslim philosopher. But there were two kinds, there were really three schools, but there were two major schools of the, they were called the Kalam, of, of Muslim philosophy. One were the Mutakalimun, and those were the fundamentalists. And they read the Quran strictly, and they read the Quran literally. There was no figurative or rational way of reading the Quran as far as they were concerned. And then you had the Mutazalite. The Mutazalite were the rational philosophers who were very much steeped in Greek philosophy. The Rambam lived in the East. Even though he started out in Spain, he lived in the East. He lived in Egypt. He lived, he lived in Israel. And therefore, he was exposed to all of these philosophical works. The French rabbis, the, the French knew nothing about this, keep, keeping in mind that there was a a strict wall between the Muslim Empire and the Christian Empire, certainly, certainly the Western Church. And so they didn't have the, they didn't have any of this philosophy. They had none of this literature. So when the Rambam writes this work, it's something very foreign to the French rabbis. It's very foreign to the West because they're not acquainted with these works. As far as they're concerned, they only know one thing, and you, and you, you must have studied that. Uh, the last mish, the la the first Mishnah in the last parak of Sanhedrin that says, "The Elu she'ain lahem chelak la'olam haba." The following people lose their share in the world to come, and one of them is, "The Yesh Omrim Af Hakore b'Sfarim Chitzonim." Somebody who reads the outside books. The Gemara says, "My Sfarim Chitzonim." What are the Sfarim Chitzonim? Chachmat Yivanit, the wisdom of the Greeks. So they knew that you're not allowed to read Greek philosophy. And here you have this person who's supposedly a rabbi, a big rabbi, he wrote this Mishnah Torah. You don't, need, you don't need any other books except for the Tanakh in my book. And look at that. He's violating and that's how they saw it. They saw it genuinely that he was violating a basic precept. And that book had to be banned. That book had to be done away with. In the first part of the Mishnah Torah, okay, we can keep the rest of it. It's just halacha. Some of it wrong, we can keep that, but the Sefer Hamada, which is philosophy, we've got to get rid of that. Because it had, even though he never quotes one Greek philosopher in the Sefer Hamada, but what do you think he got it from? 
and we'll get to we'll, we'll get to a defense of the Ramban uh, in a, in a moment about that. But I, I want to speak about why there was such an uproar in the West to the book Moranabuchen when it finally got traveled, made its way to the West. There was a, one other very important detail, which is that. As the Christian, like the Almohades, they, they, con they conquered much of the Iberian Peninsula, and then there was the reconquest, and the church, the Western church, conquered much of it back. As that was taking place, they, many Christians became acquainted with Eastern philosophy, meaning Greek philosophy. And that had a tremendous effect on how they saw the stranglehold of the church on them. And they said, you know, the church was the church based on. The, the, in, our, in our religion, there were so many mysteries, mystery after mystery. And, and the priests tell us, in the monasteries, we, we learn these are mysteries. You can't question the mysteries. Don't be a heretic. You'll, you'll never get salvation by grace, by grace. But then people slowly, as they studied philosophy, began to question some church doctrine. So what's taking place simultaneously is that there's this invasion of a new wave of thought and it's affecting the church a lot more than it's affecting the Jews so that the, so that the church has to respond to it. Moreover, we know that by the 1200s in France and in parts of Spain there was a very strong, there was a very strong mystical tendency among many rabbis. We know that Castile, Girona was seats, Spain, these were seats of Kabbalistic speculation. That's where the Zohar first appears. Pamphlets of the Zohar first appear over there. Now you know that mysticism and rationalism basically clashed with each other. So that many of the rabbis who were the French rabbis and the Spanish rabbis who were against the Rambam, it's because they saw that what he was saying was impossible in light of the Zohar, in light of mystical tradition. What he was saying was very, very wrong. But what is taking place is that the church also has to react to this. And the church reacts very, very harshly. And we know that what the church does, they, they label anybody who studies Greek philosophy as heretic, and they can be burned. And they banned all Greek works. No Christian was allowed to read Aristotle or Plato. Not only that, but we also know that there were groups of Christians in the same time. One of them, were, one group was called the Cathars. You may have heard of them. There was a, the Third Crusade was the crusade against the Cathars. Maybe you know of them as the Albigensians. Okay. So what they were, they were a group of Christians. They were a group of Christians who believed in dualism. This is not this is not my talk. This is not that far away from what was taking place in Judaism, certainly in the Castile school of Kabbalah. So they were dualists, and they believed that there's a never-ending battle between Satan and God, and Satan has equal power with God, and it's not until the end of days that that will be resolved, and, and that they, they read that in the book of Revelations of John, and they were a very strong minority in the church, and the church had to get rid of them. So there was a crusade to get rid of all of the Cathars. But this was the same thing that was taking place in Judaism. Judaism didn't have that kind of, didn't have the power that Pope Gregory IX had. They couldn't ban things and have any teeth by, by burning people at the stake. But they were very, very agitated. And when the French rabbis saw that Pope Gregory banned, my speculation, banned those works, so it was not a far cry for the northern rap for the for the French rabbis to, to do the same ban on the Rambam on the Moran of Bukhin, because you're dealing with the same kind of, of heretical material. But you had to justify it. Rabbis have to justify things because you know Jews are, they're not going to allow their rabbis to ban something without a justification. You can't say, well, it's, it's, it's heresy. Why? Why is it heresy? It's the Rambam. We heard great things about that Rambam rabbi. Great things. He's, he's a heretic. So this is what they wrote. Be, before the actual ban they wrote, the Rambam denies that miracles exist. In fact, if you do a superficial reading of the Moran of Vulcan, he does. 
Also, the Rambam has indiscriminate allegorizations of the Bible. If you read it superficially, he does. All philosophers, including the Rambam, have laxity in their performance of mitzvahs. And from their vantage point, the Rambam did. Because he said, you don't have to go to the mitzvah before you daven, daven for the other. But one of the actual things that the Rambam writes is something which is they found very scholarly. Now, there was a, a, a Jewish philosopher of the first centuries, Philo Judaeus, Philo. And he believed in what would be a doctrine of, of, me, of, of mitzvah metaphor. Let's call it mitzvah metaphor. And this is what, this is what Philo said. Philo said, now he, in that, that time you believed in logos, L-O-G-O-S. And he said, every mitzvah in the Torah has a reason. None of it is arbitrary, but it's divine, it's divine wisdom. But we can ascertain some of the reasons based, based upon logos, based upon logic. All you need to do is you need to meditate on the meaning, the deeper meaning of the mitzvah. And if you did that properly, the performance of the mitzvah was not needed. So let's say on, on sukkahs, you say, you sit in the sukkah because God protected us. So let's meditate on God's protection. You take the four species to show the beauty of the land of Israel. Let's meditate on the land of Israel. Let's have some good Israeli songs while we do it, and we can get that idea. So you don't need a lulav and an esrog, you don't need a sukkah. Okay, it didn't, it didn't, didn't do well. It helped in Alexandria for a while, it didn't do well for Jews. Jews like the sukkah, they like the esrog. But the Rambam says, in fact, I think that's correct. And that, in fact, people who are endowed with a deep knowledge of philosophy, what he would call physics and metaphysics, they would do better in terms of what the mitzvah is supposed to engender by meditating on it rather than performing it. He said, but God knows that most people are not that bright, and therefore he couldn't have one practice for one group of people and another practice for the other group of people, you meditate and you shake the lulav and therefore everybody has to do it. But in fact, if, if all other things being equal, that will be fine. And they found that to be very heretical. There's another thing that he wrote in it that they also found very heretical, which was creation. Now, and, and if, again, I'm saying in fact, if you would read the book, it's, it's true, he, he does say this. Now, creation is a problem. Um, do, do you understand why creation is a problem? I'll, let me tell you why it's a problem. Philosophical problem. Because Jews believe in creatio ex nihilo. We believe in bria yesh me'ayin. That means that nothing existed. Nothing existed. Save God. Whatever God is. But that's the only thing that existed. Total nihilism. Not open space. Not a vacuum. Not the infinity of nothing. Not helium atoms floating around looking for hydrogen atoms. Not, nothing. Nothing existed. And then everything came into existence because God willed it to. Everything. That's what we believe. And the Rambam writes, whoa, let's hold on a second. Let's hold on a second. Okay. What, what alternatives do we have to explain? The universe is here. How did it get here? Now, Aristotle believes in the co-eternity of God and the universe. God was always here, and the universe was always here. How did it get here? We don't know. But it was all, how did God get here? It was always here. It's beyond human can to know how it got into being. So why don't we as Jews, why don't we embrace that theory of, of, of the universe, the existence of the universe, not in creation, he says, well, so you think we have a problem because the Bible says in Genesis, in the beginning, the Lord created heaven. Not a problem. Because if I was convinced philosophically that Aristotle's position is correct, that the world was not created, I would re, he says this explicitly, I would re-read and reinterpret every verse in the creation story 
to accommodate itself to this theory of the eternity of the universe. But as I've been thinking about these two possibilities, I can't find any reason that one theory should be held as more logical or more reasonable than the other. Both of them are very, very difficult, so why not go with Jewish tradition? Now they found that approach to say that if Aristotle's theory was better than the tradition that we have, I would reinterpret the Bible. Now that's allegory, he would have to do as an allegory. And the Lord said, let there be, it always was. So there were, there were a number of things that he wrote, including one thing that he wrote three times. And this was one of the major sticking points of the controversy in this period, in the second per period, after he had already died, or part of it, one when he was still alive, and part after he died, which was they claimed that he did not believe in resurrection of the dead. Now, as you know, one of the principles of Judaism, which is a difficult principle, I guess, but is resurrection of the dead. That means, plain and simple, people who are dead and buried and decomposed, I'm assuming, at one point, God will revive them, and they will be alive again. They'll come out of the grave like the living dead. They'll come out of their grave, and they'll be alive again. That's a very difficult concept. And they said the Rambam did not believe that, and that makes him into a heretic. Now, between me and you, the Rambam, when he was very young, wrote a, co wrote a commentary on the Mishnah. And there were certain aspects of the Mishnah where he wrote large introductions. One of the introductions that he wrote to Sanhedrin was that he wrote about reward and punishment, and he wrote about paradise, and he wrote about hell, and he wrote about the Messiah, and he also wrote about resurrection of the dead. And then when he finishes, finishes his commentary on all of these things, he posits 13 principles of the faith. This will be part of his problem in the later, in the, in the later anti-Mamadidean controversy, which we're not going to discuss. We don't have the time for that, which was, who told the Rambam that there were 13 principles of the faith? Maybe there were 14 principles of the faith. Maybe there are three principles of the faith. As Abba says, one, as the Abba Nel says. So that was a, but there, one of his principles of the faith is resurrection of the dead. So how can you say that he didn't believe in resurrection of the dead? Well, here's, here's how you say that. Because the Rambam had a very interesting idea about what happens after you die. Now, what happens after you die? So, we know what we were taught in the third grade, if we were taught that at all. So when you die, your soul goes to heaven. Ask, ask little kids, all the little kids know this. We forget it, you know, but all of our little kids know this. What happens when somebody dies? Mommy, daddy, they go, they go to God. Well, but their body is here. No, no, their soul goes to God, and God rewards them because they're all good. Because because my grandpa and grandma were all good, and they, God rewards them. How does he reward them? I don't know. So, so what, what is it that Jews believe? You believe in reward and punishment. What do you believe? No, the Muslims, the Ramam quotes the Muslims, but the, I don't have to be graphic about it, but the Muslims, they only have paradise, it seems, for men. But <laughs> the paradise for men... <clears throat> There's some, there's some woman in there. There's a seventy. That was a joke. Yeah. It's a rabbi joke. No, seventy woman. It's not as good as the men's, okay? <laughs> Whatever. But uh, what I'm trying to say is they believe in some kind of physicality after you're dead. If you read the Egyptian Book of the Dead, they believe in physicality after you're dead. In the ancient book, the Etruscans, the Hittites, all of them believed in some kind of bodily reward after you're dead. Illusion feels. That's what they believe, or everybody believes in. So, so Ramam says, Hatipshim Ha'aravim. And basically he says, we know what their reward is. How can you do it without a body? How, does it, how do you do that without a body? So he says, in fact, what we believe is that the reward is a disembodied soul and an incorporeal intellectual pleasure. That's what it is. And they, they said, that's, that's, that's Jewish tradition? Some kind of... doesn't make any sense. Moreover, the Rambam writes that that... He says, I write this, and you're going to say to yourself, oh, come on, that's the reward that I'm going to get? Like, I sit there in class? 
in a, in a deep physics elective, that's it for eternity? And I understand all of the formulas, that's my reward? That's what you're gonna say. He said, but let me tell you something. You don't realize that intellectual pleasure is the greatest pleasure that exists because it's constant. Physical pleasure, you, you have it, then it's gone. But intellectual pleasure is forever. And if I would tell you the speciality of intellectual pleasure, etc., 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 etc. But when he gets to Tchias Hamesim, he has not much to say. He, what he writes is, Pshuto Kamash So they assailed him in his lifetime. Come on, you're, you're so verbose about everything else, about Mashiach, about all the rewards. That's all you can write, Pshuto Kamash What it says is what it is. Resurrection of the dead, no explanation. So he writes a special work called Igeret Chiyat HaMetim. And he says, I know that I am being assailed even by people who are not my antagonists. And they believe somehow that I don't believe in resurrection of the dead. So I am writing this work to explain to you that I believe in it. Says, but by the way, now that I'm thinking about it, this is what he writes. You know, for people who want to criticize, there's no explanation. So rather than writing about Tchiyat HaMetim, let me tell you again about Olam Haba. Let me tell you about intellectual pleasure. Let me tell you about the disembodied soul. Now let me tell you all about this. And that's his work. Right? So, Aha! He couldn't even, when he's defending himself, say what Tchiyat HaMetim is. And they actually believed that he did not believe that. And that was the, one of the basis, bases of the ban is because he denied one of the tenets of the faith. And that's a, that was a, a, a tremendously, a tremendously powerful, powerful thing that they did. Okay. Now, the Ramban Nachmanides, who lives in Spain, in Barcelona, at this time, he's, he's, a, he's a very young man, he's 20 years old, and he sees what's taking place, and he feels that it's very, very wrong, because very great rabbis, one of them, his brother-in-law, Rabbeinu Yonah, Rabbeinu Yonah of Gorona, Shavi Tshuva, Rabbi Rabbeinu Yonah, Tamid Rabbeinu Yonah on Brachos, Rabbeinu Yonah on everything. He was a great, one of the great Rishonim of Gorona. And he was one of the people that was involved in the band. A very great rabbis, Shlomo Montpellier, he had very great rabbis who were very, who were very much involved in the band. The Ramah, Rabbeinu Meir Halevi Todros, also, one of the great Rishonim involved with the band. So the Ramban wrote a letter, a very famous letter, known as the letter to the French rabbis. And in it, what he says to them is, he says, I'm one of you, as you know, I'm one of you. Now keep in mind that the Ramban, Nachmanides, had great credentials. He was a physician, he was a philosopher, he was a Talmudist, he was a Halachist, he was a Kabbalist, and he was a person who was very well steeped in, 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 in Greek philosophy. So he, he put it all together. And he was the chief rabbi of Spain for a while. So he was a person very much admired, very well respected, and whose knowledge was very eclectic. There was nothing, there was nothing that could be known in the 13th century that he didn't know. So he was a very, very great scholar. And this is what he writes. He said, you know, I, I understand. Uh, there's, a, there's a debate between Charles Chevelle and David Berger but how to read this letter. So we, we can't go into it, but if, you, if you're very interested, you can even get it online. It was David Berger's masters. David, you ever know David Berger is one of the preeminent mm -hmm. historians of the medieval period. He's the, he's the dean of Bernard Bevel Graduate School. He's a, a crush of a historian. So he, his master's thesis was on this. Even your brother likes him. Mm. Right now. <laughs> Not now, okay. Now he does. Yeah, yeah. No, he, he respects him as a scholar. So I'm not going to get involved in how, uh, how to interpret it, but this is what he said. You can just take that what he said. He said, I give you three reasons why this ban and this attack on the Ramban is wrong, and I think you should recant. The first is, he's very popular in the East. And even in the West, the people who are intellectuals have his book. And they're reading the book, you know, upstairs. So you can't see it. They're reading his book. I know because they're asking me questions about it. So I know that they're reading his book. Moreover, we already have factions. Jewish people already have factions. We're already fighting about, about little silly things. This is going to be a war. 
a war pro Maimonides and against Maimonides. Do we want a war? Is it worth it? Secondly, what you call heretical dicta, I read through the Mishnah Torah, there's not one thing that he writes there that's not true. Now again, with, with the imprimatur of the Ramban, that, ha that holds a lot of weight. There's not one thing that he writes there that's not true. And he even attacks one of the attackers, one of the great attackers of the Rambam is the Ra'ah, by the way, Avram ben David of Hasperus, a very great, a very great antagonist. He's even in his book. He's in the Mishnah, so he's right there to attack. And one of the attacks that he has is the Rambam speaks about the belief in God, that you have to believe in God. Now, what, we, what, is it, what do you believe in? What, do you, what does that mean? So the Rambam has a list of things that God is and God is not. Basically, what God is not, you know, the negative attributes theory of the Rambam. And one of them is that God is incorporeal, meaning no matter, no form, totally, totally without any, any, any shape, form, even metaphysical reality. There's no reality to God whatsoever. Mufshat v'chlal is totally, totally abstract. And anybody that believes that God has a body, they're, her they're heretics. They don't believe in God. What, what are you going to do with the verses that said the, the hand of God and God's might? He says, those are all Debrat, Torah, Kushon, B'nai Adam. Those are all anthropomorphisms. That's how the Torah speaks. The Torah speaks in human language because since we don't know what God is, so the effect of what God did would be the same as somebody would, would punch somebody. That's anthrop Sometimes it says God gets angry, God is happy. That's anthropoemphatic statements, which is the same as the anthropomorphic statements we would associate if somebody does something good is because they're happy with you. If they punish you is because they're not happy. And that's what it means. The rabbi says, excuse me, you're going to tell me that somebody that reads the Bible and the Tanakh and they read the Medrash and they come to the conclusion that God has some kind of physicality to them, that those people are heretics? And he writes in it, even Rabbis greater than the Ramban believe that God has a body. So the Ramban says, really? Really? There are people who believe that God has a body? That's, that's, that's nonsense. So you, you're going to ban it based upon the rival's objection. And the third objection that he has, which is a, a very great objection, was that if you read the Ramban, even the moment of Ruchim carefully, you realize that there are problems. In other words, part of his plan, this David Berger was thinking, is if somebody is, is, is really wants to put a ban on something, and you come and say, stop, you can't do anything. So, anything, you gotta do something. So the Rambam did, but even though the Rambam wanted them to do nothing, but he knew it wouldn't work if he said do nothing, so therefore what he says to them is, look, there are problems with the Mormon of Ruchim, so your ban should be that there should not be public study groups of Moran Ruchim, but people can study, study it privately. And if you do that, if you do that, you'll be doing a decent thing. So they were about to do that, and then unfortunately, a terrible, a terrible thing happened, which was the Dominican monks in a monastery in the, in the middle of Paris took the Rambam's works and burned them on the altar, the main altar of the monastery. And everybody was so shocked by what had taken place. And even Rabbi Yonah said, I'm out. He said, this happened as punishment that was against the Rambam, God's for the Rambam. There's no doubt about it. He doesn't believe in miracles, but I believe in miracles, and God is, is against us. And Rabbi Yonah said, there's even apocryphal legend that he wrote the Shah Rechuva, which is a book about repentance, as his way of achieving atonement for his attack against the Rambam. I don't, nobody knows if it's true or not. It's a good story, and it might, it might very well be true. And, and that ended the major part of the, the second round, the, the, major part, the major round of the Maimonidean, Maimonidean controversy. But of course, it never ends, because a number of years later, the controversy comes back. And it comes back based upon the following. So in the East, c 
Kabbalah begins to make a move. Because there are many rabbis who flee, who flee Spain, and they go to Israel. Right? We know the Ramban fled Spain, and he went to Israel. And there were many others who did as well. One of them was Rabbi Yitzhak Sagi Nahor, supposedly the author of the Zohar. So he escaped and he goes to Akko. And he, he reads the Nemora Nebuchadnezzar there for the first time. And he says, this is scurrilous. He's a great Kabbalist. This is scurrilous. And he says, it has to be burned. It has to be... Now the Rambam's son, has a son, Abraham. The Rambam's son hears about this attack and that many people are attacking it. What they actually did was, it's unfortunate, Ze zealots do this. They attack the grave of the Rambam in Tiberias. In Tiberias. They, 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 they desecrated the entire grave as it was a heretic. They spray, I guess, in today's thing, they spray painted heretic on it, min on it. They, they desecrated it. And therefore, he maintained that I'm going to defend my father. My father wouldn't like me to defend him because they're all idiots, but I'm going to do it anyway. And he writes a book called Milchamot Hashem. The Ramban also wrote a book like that, but that's to defend the riff against the Bahamor. Everybody's fighting the, 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 the Lord's fight. So the, the son of the Rambam writes a book, Milchamot Hashem, in which he explains all of the comments of his father in a way that is consistent with Jewish tradition. And he said, that's what my father believed because that's what my father taught me. And everything that he said is correct. And he tried to show in that book that reason and logic are the hallmarks of Judaism. And one of the proofs that he even brings is that the progenitor of our faith is Abraham. And the Medrash told us, how did Abraham discover God? Not through some kind of mystical experience, but as a young person, he's in a cave, and he sees the sun. He says, well, everybody believes the sun is a god. Well, the, the sun goes down. Oh, then the moon comes out. The moon must have vanquished the sun. OK, the moon is God. But then the moon's gone in the morning. And he, he went through this kind of logical thing. Well, where, where do all these things come from? Which is now known as the teleological proof of God. And he came to a philosophic conclusion that there must be an all-powerful God that controls all of the forces that everybody else worships. So the Rambam himself, in a cave, not a caveman, but in a, in a cave is where he uses reason and logic to ascertain that God exists. So how can you say that philosophy is anathema to Judaism? So of course, many people were very happy with this book, and the people, other people were not happy with this book. And there was the following thing that took place. I'll, I'll, I'll come to the end of this, sort of. Another round, which takes place in the 14th century, in the 1300s. Now, so you can understand that there are people who are adherents of, of, of the Rambam, and there are people who are protagonists against the Rambam. Now, what about regular people? Those are just rabbis. What about regular people? Because keep in mind, the rabbis are making, if you're a pro-Rambam, so you're making a sermon in shul, those people attack the Rambam, they don't know what they're doing, and we believe in rationalism, and I'm going to talk about rationalism, I'll give you a sermon that's rational, and the people on the other side are going, Shkutzen was they zenin, say they globin, and they're saying all kinds of things, so that the people who are the hamonam, the regular citizen, they are also taking sides. So what is taking place is that many people who are pro-Rambam are, are continuing what they think is the trend of the Rambam. They're taking the ball and they're running with it. And they're no longer faithful to what the Rambam said, but they're going much further than the Rambam went. And you actually have people who are not keeping the law. People who are breaking the law by using a number of ra what they consider to be rational arguments. And they're saying things that are patently, are patently not true. And they're beginning to interpret the Bible metaphorically. Like in one of, one of those books, who was an actual a student of one of the Rambam students, he writes that Avraham and Sarah never existed, but one of them is logic and the other is reason. You're happy to know that the woman was reason and the man was logic. And that's what they would do, that everything was allegorical and that anything was metaphorical and none of it exists. None of it existed. All of it is a mashal umalitza, all of it is an allegory. And so then, this is taking place in a very, very large order, and the rabbis feel 
that they have to they have to address it. So the traditionalists create another ban. And this time it's a ban that's gonna stick. And everybody heard you all heard of this ban. You'll see a little bit of the detail. You heard wrong. You mix together two bands. But this is this is this is the, the following ban. Because now the people who are supposedly adherents of the Rambam, they say no miracles took place, not even Kriyat Yamsuf, God never even programmed, right? The Rambam says that God, what's well, a miracle is not really a miracle, but God programmed. It's a very, it's a, it's a very difficult concept. Are you acquainted with what I'm saying? The Rambam writes in Moran of Ruchim that God doesn't do miracles. There's no such thing as a miracle because God created the natural order. And if he wanted the natural order to change, he would have, he would have made the natural order. And God is also it's the categorical imperative of, of natural order, and nobody can change it, not even God. Well, so how do you explain miracles? Well, they probably didn't take place, or they were prophetic dreams. Prophet, prophet, prophet had a dream. In a dream, you can imagine a flying elephant. Not a problem. So what, but what are you going to do with the splitting of the Red Sea? That's a hard one. Not a dream. So the Rambam says, you know, when God created the world, he knew that 2,448 years later, on the 22nd day of Nisan, of that lunar calendar, the Jews needed to cross the Red Sea. So what God did is when he created the Red Sea, he programmed it that it splits exactly that moment, 2,448 years later. He says it, not tongue-in-cheek. He means it. No, that's, that's incredible that the Jews just happened to have gotten to the Red Sea exactly. Now, I have no problem with God's program, but the human, the human element has to also, the God program the Jews to walk quickly or slowly? It's, 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 so that's, that's what he said. So they said, look, you know, see, what he, what the Rambam just couldn't say, it's like Spinoza, he couldn't say what he really believed, even though he said heretical things, he, really, he believed a lot more heretical stuff. He was an Amsterdam Christian. Europe, you couldn't do it at that time. So the Rambam really didn't believe in miracles. So they're preaching that there were no miracles. And you have to have philosophy. So the, the crux of the, of, of the issue now is edu education of the children. How do you educate children? Do you teach them rationalism and philosophy? Or do you teach them rabbinic Judaism, which they consider to be obscurant ju Judaism? What do you teach the children? And it became a major debate. The rationalists say you teach the children rationalism. And the traditionalists say you teach them tradition. And that's what the debate was. And therefore, the rabbis felt that they had to address it. Now, one of the people who they attacked, some of you know him well, is Rabbi Menachem Me'iri of Provence. Now, the, Me the Me'iri, his books are right over there. You have all these people's books. After all the dust settled, you know, nobody even knows that they were fighting or what they were fighting about. But the Me'iri was a, was a rationalist, but a traditional rationalist, and they even attacked him. Now, here, here was what the attack was. At that time, doctors in the, in, the, in the Christian world discovered a new cure, and it was called astral magic. And you'll find this in, in the history of why I first saw it, in the history of medicine books. Astral magic. And they believed, and the ancient Egyptians believed this as well. Like when you go to Giza, I don't know if you go to Giza, but if you go to Giza, you will notice, or you should notice, that there were three pyramids in the descending side, and all of them are made in a manner so that when it is the spring equinox, the sun will hit the first one to the second one to the third one. It sounds like Steven Spielberg, but it's not. And that's why you, you, if, you, if you look about a half a mile down, there's the Temple of Giza. And when people would, they would, people would line up for the, uh, the, the week of the spring equinox, they would walk in that temple where they had refle re reflecting panels of, of copper, and they would be healed by the sun. Right? Even the Pasuk in the, in, the, in the Navi, Shemesh Marpe. So there was that kind of astral magic kind of therapy. So this was something that was taking place in the 1300s. He went to a doctor and he did astral magic. <laughs> Feel better. <clears throat> so this was what the rationalists were now doing because they took it from the, from the doctors. And the rabbis were saying, this is kishuf. This is sorcery. 
We don't believe in astral magic. We don't believe in magic. Now I have to believe in magic. And they actually got together, and they got together Spain, together with Germany, the Rosh and the Rajba, two great rabbis, the Rosh of Usher ben Yechia, the Rajba of Shlomo ben Aderet, from the, Ram, the Ramban school, student of the Ramban, and they, they, have, they had a band. And this, is what, this is what the band said, it had the actual language. It was a July 26, 1305. They said, any member of our community under the age of 25 shall not study the works of the Greeks on science or metaphysics, whether in the original or language or in translation. So everybody thinks they said you can't study the Moran of Ulkham unless you're 40. Right? That's what everybody hears. There's no such thing. That was a, an edict that takes place in the aftermath of Shab Tzvi in Padua, where they banned the study of the Zohar until you're 40, because it's been, been Arba in Medina. But over here, this is 25. When you're 25, then you're supposed to, that, that they believe that you had your full faculties, and then you'll be able to, to, to study these things. That was the first part of the ban. The second part of the ban, to show how popular that alleg allegorization was among the rationalists, and the second part of the ban says, any person who says that Abraham and, Sa and Sarah symbolize reason and logic, or matter or form, or that the 12 tribes are merely an allegory for the 12 planets, those people will be banned. And that was the, that was the ban. It didn't have much teeth because the Me'iri rejected it. He wouldn't sign it. And he said, it's a stupid ban. It's a foolish ban. And he says, every ban is self-defeating. That's A. And B, how can you be a Torah scholar without a deep knowledge of mathematics? Excellent question that we should ask even today. Now, what ended the controversy, now the, the previous controversy ended when they burned the Rambam's books. What ended this controversy was that on 722, three, a year later, 722, July 22nd, 1306, King Philip IV expelled all the Jews from France and Andalusia. So they got exiled, they're walking without any shoes, so they have no time to fight. Okay, so I just want to mention the last minute that this debate continued unabated up until the period of the expulsion from Spain. The Abravanel, who was a rationalist, he was from the rationalist school, he wrote, as he was expelled, he said, there's no doubt in my mind that the expulsion from Spain came about because we rejected rabbinic Judaism and we embraced rationalism, and that is why we are leaving and in such tremendous shame and embarrassment. And if you actually read the works that he wrote after the expulsion from Spain, they're all dated, so you can see them after 1492, all of them have a change in tone. All of them are rabbinic Judaism. He no longer writes his famous thing that he had in his first works. The rabbi said what they, what they said. But it, it continued in the period of the Ramah and the Marshal. The Ramah was a rationalist. We don't know him as that, but he was a rationalist. And he wrote a book, Torah Chatat, where he extols the virtues of Greek philosophy. And the Marshal, Rabbi Shlomo Luria, says, I thought the Shulchan Aruch should be banned, and I think the Torah Chatat should be banned. And that young whippersnapper, he died at the age of 33, that young whippersnapper, he has no right to write any books without coming to the greater rabbis for us to give him approbation. So it continued. But I, I, and then just, I'm gonna read you one statement. We have to have Meyer now, right? Do we'll I have time for one statement of the Vilna going? Okay. Now this is, actually, I'll tell you where it is. I had, I had, I had a long day today. So this, it happens to be in the Shulchan or Chilchot Ma'onein U Menachesh. Sorcery. The laws of sorcery that you're not allowed to do. So there's a, there's, a, there's a statement in the Talmud that if somebody is very sick, there are certain incantations <coughs> that you can recite. So the question is, can you do this on Shabbos? Because you're not allowed to like, pray on Shabbos. So the Rambam says if the person's deathly ill, you're allowed to do it. And the Shulchan says you can do that. Because, not that they help one whit, but since people who are dying are agitated, this will calm them down before they die. But that, it's, it doesn't, and he, he, the Rambam really is very dismissive of what the Talmud says. So the Vilna Gaon writes the following. 
אבל כל הבאים אחריו כבר היכו אותו על כד כדו. שהרי מצינו הרבה מעשיות בגמרא על פי שמות וכשפים, and he quotes a whole bunch of them, and then he says the following. So why does the Rambam use this language? The Vilna Gaon is a great rabbi. והפילוסופיה היא תיתו ברוב לך לפרש הגמרא הכל בדרך חלצאי, everything metaphorically, allegorically, ולהכור אותם מפשטן, וחס ושלום, איני מאמין בהם ולא מהם ולא מהמונם, אלא כל הדברים הם פשוטן, אלא שיש בהם פנימיות, לא פנימיות של בעלי הפילוסופיה שזורקים אותו באשפה, שהן חיצוניות באמת, אלא של בעלי האמת שהיא אמת אמיתית. So, as you can see, The, the anti-modern controversy still goes on. I look at it, Shiva University, Bar-Ilan, Lakewood, Ponovish, the debate. I'm, I'm not saying it. These are still the same positions. I think legitimate positions that are held and the debate goes on. And they still have bands, they counter bands. So we're waiting for Mashiach, one of the 13th Everybody has a show up. Oh, yeah.